So hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jillian Bloomfield and I work for the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative at Yale University, or LT. I'm very pleased to welcome you today to the official launch of our eight part webinar series uh, entitled Capacity Development for Forest Landscape Restoration. LT is an initiative of Yale University's School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, soon to be School of the Environment which receives generous support from Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. We are a global team of individuals and partner institutions who work to train and support people from all sectors and backgrounds to restore and conserve tropical forest landscapes using strategies that support biodiversity and livelihoods. Especially during this time of uncertainty, our team wanted to offer this series to share with you some of the key approaches and lessons learned from capacity, the capacity development work of our LT staff, affiliates, and alumni working worldwide. You can see on the screen here, this is the, um, this is the flyer for the entire series. We're starting today in June with the training of trainers approach. We'll talk about extension services uh, in July. Uh, perspectives on successful training from a panel of alumni of our training events in August. Then a presentation about building logical frameworks for action. We'll talk about the power of training mixed audiences in October. Uh, I'll talk in November about online course design and monitoring. In Jan we'll skip December because of the holidays uh, and then have in January benefits and challenges of field training and then go into in February to close out our session a uh, presentation on the importance of interdisciplinary training uh, by our director, Eva Guerin. With everyone in various levels of lockdown, we're so grateful for these online ways to connect with each other and exchange knowledge and ideas. So we thank you very much for coming today. Before our first speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Eva Guerin, LT director for a few opening words. Great. Thank you so much, Jillian. Um, I really appreciate your introduction. Thank you all uh, for attending this webinar series on capacity development for forest landscape restoration. It's really exciting for us to be here to share these experiences and to be able to interact with all of you virtually. So as many of you may be aware, uh, forest landscape restoration, which we refer to as FLR, has received uh, global recognition in recent years as a meeting a number of international goals and national commitments. And these include the Sustainable Development Goals, the IT Biodiversity Targets, the New York Declaration on Forests, and the Bond Challenge, and others. Also, the Declaration um, of 2021 to 2030 as the UN Decade on System Restoration will accelerate these global restoration goals and commitments. So as defined by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, FLR is the ongoing process of regaining ecological functionality, enhancing human well being across deforested or degraded forest landscapes. So, FLR is more than just tree planting, um, it encompasses an array of land use practices, and that can include promoting natural regeneration of forest and tree cover and establishing forestry systems. So, careful attention must be given to the social, cultural, economic, political, and ecological context of the landscape when designing and implementing an FLR intervention. So despite increased focus on FLR in recent years, um, there is a gap in how to design, implement, and scale FLR intervention in diverse contexts around the globe, last into the future. And so leaders are urgently needed to accelerate high quality and sustainable FLR interventions and developing capacity of leaders to fill this gap um, in the tropics has been the focus of, of LT4 for the past 14 years. So for LT, capacity development means providing the people who manage and govern tropical forest landscapes with theoretical and applied knowledge from many sources and disciplines on an array of land management strategies that help to regain ecological functionality while supporting livelihoods. I do this by offering field and online courses and open access materials, and also by providing alumni of our courses with technical mentorship and financial support to share and apply the knowledge that they need. So in this eight part of our series, you're gonna hear from team, team members from the tropics about um, different aspects of our capacity development model as it's applied to FLR. Um, and you're also gonna hear from a couple of alumni about their uh, perspectives 
capacity development. Um, so we're excited to have you join us today for the series and we very much look forward to your questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. And as mentioned, today's presentation and discussion is on the theme of training of trainers, uh, a training of trainers approach to restoration in Panama, presented by Jacob Slesser. Jacob is an LT affiliate based in Panama. He is a forester by training with over a decade of experience working in Panama, designing and implementing forest restoration projects in agricultural landscapes. At LT, he works to improve the capacity and leadership of rural people to empower them as land stewards and to demonstrate and promote positive land use decisions for future generations. So Jacob, we're very glad to have you here today. We'll have time for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. So please submit your questions using the Q&A feature during the presentation. And we also encourage you to submit the poll about your familiarity with training of trainers as a capacity development approach. And again, feel free to comment in the chat with any related details you would like to share. Thank you again, Jake, and uh, take it away. Okay. And thank you to Evangeline for the wonderful introduction. Oops. Okay. Alrighty. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you for attending. Uh, I'm really hoping that um, we don't get zoom bombed by my two year old daughter who is becoming extremely skilled at opening locked doors. So let's cross our fingers for that. Um, but anyways, capacity building is such a central component of forest landscape restoration. So I'm very excited to present about a training of trainers approach to restoration. Uh, which is focused in the Azuero Peninsula uh, of Panama. So during this presentation, I'll provide a brief context of the Azuero and restoration approaches that have been implemented in this region. Uh, next, I'll, I'll discuss the training of trainers model that we developed to equip farmers in the region with enhanced skills and knowledge to conduct and disseminate restoration practices to others. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about a, a case study where I'll illustrate the impact of a group of farmers who participated in our TOT model and then served as trainers. So I wanna start out here uh, and talk about the importance of conserving forests in protected areas and how it's created important islands of biodiversity. But agricultural landscapes are also needed to maintain this ecological uh, connectivity. Um, and to approach a more resilient landscape with greater biodiversity connectivity, we need to support farmers to restore and conserve forests on their farms. And while there are protected areas with mature forests and rich biodiversity in Panama, these areas are becoming more isolated due to the forest degradation and fragmentation occurring in agricultural landscapes that surround them. And most of the most severely degraded region is the Azuero Peninsula, where the majority of Panama's tropical dry forest ecosystem is located. There is little original forest cover remaining, the consequence of hundreds of years of deforestation for agriculture and conventional livestock production. Because there is a great need for restoration, LT's efforts in Panama are heavily focused in the Azuero. What we find today in the Azuero is a highly fragmented agricultural mosaic landscape with a mixture of cattle pastures, crops, uh, patches of secondary dry tropical forest. And compounding the degraded landscape are prolonged four to five month annual droughts and irregular rainfall, making the landscape uh, much more vulnerable to, to climate change. And news articles uh, have highlighted uh, how for decades uh, deforestation and unsustainable land use practices in the Azuero are degrading ecosystem services and consequently threatening local livelihoods. So it's, it's very well known in the region. Despite these trends, landowners in the Azuero continue to raise cattle using conventional approaches since ranching is so deeply rooted in the region's agrarian economy and folkloric traditions. That's why forest restoration strategies must complement and support traditional livelihood practices rather than replace them. Furthermore, cattle ranching is common throughout Latin American landscapes, a legacy of Spanish colonization, which highlights the urgency to develop effective restoration strategies. So a question for all of you who will not be able to answer me directly, but uh, what strategy or strategies can be utilized to restore forests and enhance rural livelihoods 
in these types of productive landscapes. Civil pastoral systems integrate trees and shrubs into cattle pastures to improve ecosystem function and agricultural production. They're an effective and scientifically proven approach because these systems can conserve biodiversity and enhance traditional cattle ranching livelihoods. The top of the slide illustrates how trees and shrubs are integrated use, using civil pastoral systems in contrast to the use of pasture grass only in a conventional cattle ranching system that you can see on the bottom half of the slide. So while conventional systems have very little biodiversity and can only support one cow per hectare, civil pastoral systems support much higher levels of biodiversity and can maintain between three to five heads of cattle per hectare. So while civil pastoral systems are highlighted as a sound approach, how can these practices and appropriate technologies be disseminated and adopted by other ranchers? Well, one method is through capacity building. And LT began facilitating courses on civil pastoral systems in the Azuero starting in 2009. These courses targeted decision makers such as ministry officials, extension agents, NGO staff, local farmers. And while extension agents are a preferred audience because of the role to disseminate agricultural knowledge, we also wanted to include farmers to create better networks and inform both audiences about civil pastoral practices. So after these courses, there was really a great amount of excitement amongst the farmers who wanted to implement civil pastoral systems on their farm. But is helping farmers establish civil pastoral systems the best way to increase restoration capacity with limited resources? Or maybe we should just train extension agents and officials. If we consider farmer to, if we consider farmer, to farmer learning, it really can be an effective way to transmit information and facilitate capacity development. And this is because farmers access to information commonly comes from other farmers. Because of trust and shared attributes, farmers are inclined to learn from fellow farmers. Trained farmers who are integrated into the community can help change attitudes of others and encourage the adoption of technologies. Farmers can realistically communicate the effort and investment needed for new practices, which is sometimes a barrier with extension agents and other professionals who come from outside the community. And while farmer to farmer learning does occur organically, a more deliberate approach to strengthen the capacity and leadership skills of farmers so that they can serve a prom as promoters of restoration is through the training of trainers. A training of trainers is where you build a team of proficient educators who can train others and act as extensions of knowledge. Trainers develop technical and leadership, uh, leadership skills to effectively communicate to diverse audiences. The TOT creates a multiplier effect, expanding the impacts to reach greater numbers of people. And finally, the training of trainers has been used by extensionists for decades uh, in farmer field schools. So, 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 consider, so, con so considering the potential of farmer to farmer learning and the multiplier effect of training of trainers, LT set out to educate and empower farmers in order to create community-based centers of knowledge so that local farmers could make informed decisions on their farms and also disseminate the information to others and be the agent of change in the landscape. So our model contains these three following co components that you can see on the slide. First, we wanted to focus on capacity development in order to equip farmers with enhanced skills and knowledge to establish and manage civil pastoral systems and other restoration strategies that are compatible with their ranching and agricultural livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Second, through continued leadership development, we help, we help farmers gain confidence, motivation, and experience to develop their own community-based organizations, apply for funding and resources, and establish a network of model farms and be able to monitor those results. And then third, through long-term trainer development, farmers learn effective methods of communication and how to teach others using ex experimental technique, techniques, training materials, and the network of, of model farms as confident and motivated leaders. So for each component, I'll describe the methods that we utilized. And first I'll discuss capacity development component of, of, of the model through our facilitation of field-based restoration training courses, which we facilitate in, our, in what are called our focal training landscapes, a network of privately owned properties in the Azuero where we teach restoration science and practice. First, our main capacity building approach is through multiple day field courses as a form of experiential place-based learning. This approach provides for more immersive learning where participants learn about the local context from both its people and its ecosystem. Active learning is a 
definitely a key component of these courses because it doesn't just require memorization, but putting newly acquired knowledge to the test through individual and group exercises. This type of active learning is transformational in that it requires participants to explore, reflect, and then consequent, consequently innovate. And to illustrate how we facilitate experiential place-based learning, the following slides describe the specific methods of how we do that. First, we train small groups, never larger than 15 participants in order to provide maximum student instructor ratio and foster more direct interaction. Second, restoration fundamentals are introduced through interactive lectures and, and exercises to integrate audience participation. Next, we complement restoration fundamentals by teaching directly in the forest, discussing the principles of ecology and forest ecosystem services via demonstration areas that were pre-selected and developed within an interpretive trail network. Additionally, these areas help reinforce learning via active observations and group exercises that encourage participants to explore and reflect while working collaboratively, collaboratively with others. After strengthening participants' understanding of forest, economic, forest ecology and dynamics, they visit a series of model farms. And these model farms are owned and operate, operated by local farmers who describe the process of conducting a range of restoration practices to transform both ecological integrity and agricultural production. And these visits provide a human element to restoration, illustrating challenges and best practices conducted by a landowner and providing a farmer to farmer learning experience. So if we look beyond restoration principles, participants also learn about new and sustainable technologies, which help to aid in more efficient forest conservation and restoration activities, while also improving agricultural production for these win-win types of outcomes. This slide illustrates, for example, the importance of a solar powered water system, which is the first step in establishing a cattle aqueduct system for a civil pastoral system. But it also provides the opportunity to sustainably use water resources and restore degraded riparian areas. Participants can also conduct active restoration exercises so that they can reinforce learning by practicing and strengthening their skill set. Here we see participants learning how to scarify different types of tree seeds and the appropriate planting methods uh, to, to propagate these saplings in the nursery. Participants also are, are provided with multiple opportunities to apply the restoration skills under a supervised session where feedback is provided by instructors. Here participants practice restoration activities within a wildlife corridor that was developed inside a model farm. Participants working in groups are tasked with guided exercises which fosters critical and analytical thinking by teaching the process of collecting information, conducting an analysis, and developing appropriate actions. We can, see, we can see here in this slide, uh, participants are completing a rapid uh, farm assessment in order to develop a restoration strategy, which they will propose to the actual farm owner during this course. And then finally, participants put newly acquired knowledge and skills to the test by developing a farm management plan for their own property. They receive direct feedback during the final session so that they complete the course with the finalized product, which can be applied under returning to their community. And it's really important to note here that we're, that we're not just inviting farmers to these courses. Rather, we work with our local partners to invite extension agents who are responsible for selecting a local farmer based on their interest and willingness to, to try new restoration practices on farm. That way we receive open-minded and innovative farmers who are willing to learn and experiment. In addition, we leverage the support of extension agents after the course as well to help provide additional mentoring and support for farmers. So once the course is completed, course alumni are well-trained individuals with a new set of impl new, a new skill set for implementing restoration and a concrete uh, restoration plan for their farm. Nevertheless, LT in collaboration with local partners provide that follow-up assistance and mentoring based on the participants' individual needs. So now I'll describe how our course alumni develop into stronger leaders. So the initial goal after the course is to implement the farm plan for continued experimentation, learning, as well as dissemination. Providing technical support to farmers helps, helps them transition from the course to conduct forest restoration activities on farm. And this often requires providing additional resources, training, uh, connecting them with local partners for mentoring, those sorts of things. And often participants of the field courses, they, they, they spread enthusiasm in the community to conduct restoration activities. 
The problem is that many restoration activities involving civil pastoral systems and tree planting are, are rather expensive to implement. So forming legally recognized community-based associations provides the opportunity for farmers with similar interests to develop a collective voice, a collaborative strength, and the entity to solicit restoration funds. In Panama, this is one of the few ways that farmers can obtain funding for restoration projects is to develop their own community-based organization. And assistance is often needed to help farmers develop the objectives and rules of an association and, and really how to, the process to legally establish it. Additionally, members of new form, newly formed organizations need guidance on how to facilitate effective meetings, manage finances, and resolve conflicts. These leadership skills are taught through workshops as well as observing experienced community associations. And so while it's easier for NGOs to apply and obtain restoration funding and disperse it to farmers, it is an important step in the leadership development of community organization and organizations for them to directly receive funding and manage projects, which in the long term minimizes their dependence on NGOs and local authorities. Recently established community organizations may not have the capacity to compose complicated grant proposals. So helping identify funding opportunities and assisting in the process, utilizing their ideas and objectives to develop a proposal is effective because it integrates their input and teaches them the process and skills needed for fundraising. And like grant writing, com uh, community groups with little experience implementing projects require regular mentoring and support in order to boost confidence and avoid problems that can delay the project or lose confidence in the association, which is pretty common. While backstopping a community's project is a large investment in time and resources, the process is an empowering and, and empowering helps farmers learn how to take more ownership in decision making. And developing monitoring skills is essential for farmers to, to measure and assess the success of restoration interventions and whether they, they really you know, need modification. It also helps farmers to interpret results so that they can, they can communicate lessons learned to others. Simple monitoring activities can be taught uh, to, to farmers. And for example, taking soil samples to observe characteristics of soil structure and the diversity of soil insects. It's a sound indicator of soil health. Uh, also production indicators are tracked by farmers comparing differences in cattle stocking rates or milk production, but also learning about how to sample and weigh uh, forage biomass as you see um, in this slide is also very important. Now third, <clears throat> and through long-term trainer development, farmers are trained on effective methods of communication and how to teach others using experimental tra techniques, training materials, and the network of model farms as confident and motivated leaders. So I just want to start out this, this the third component of this by mentioning that you know, farmers are incredibly intelligent people with a wealth of knowledge, years of trial and error in applied setting. And it's really important to know that when you're training farmers. And additionally, farmers are often exceptional communicators and their use of hands-on demonstrations, stories, antidotes, jokes, gives them an advanced level of being prepared and especially when training other farmers. So our approach encourages farmers to be themselves and tell the story of their farm, describing how it was historically managed, the motivations to seek alternatives such as, as, as restoration activities, and what were the initial doubts that they had. Farmers are also encouraged to focus on their best practices, but also, as, and this is especially true, challenges and failures and explaining the process of overcoming them. Farmers are encouraged to discuss the importance of valuing the results of restoration activities from different perspectives. For example, not just focusing on the economic benefits of civil pastoral systems, but the ecological benefits of conserving patches of forest for wildlife or utilizing the conservation efforts and, and less agrochemicals, which has a positive benefit for their own, their own health as well as the community's health. Farmers are trained how to introduce different restoration themes explain technical and scientific information in a practical manner and how to demonstrate restoration techniques. So farmers are encouraged to really use analogies to describe different systems or biological processes. For example, to describe the importance of using diverse nutritional forage species in a civil pastoral system, as you see on the left, 
Farmers use the analogy of a traditional meal with chicken, beans, and rice, relating each food with a specific plant species in their model civil pastoral farm that provides livestock forage and the equivalent dietary nutrition to be productive. I hope not everybody didn't just get hungry being 11 o'clock. Anyways, uh, farmers are quick to share the increase in cattle stocking rates of, or, or milk production as a result of establishing civil pastoral systems like I mentioned earlier. But they're also trained to discuss the importance of conserving functional biodiversity, which provides economic benefits through savings of not having to pay for an ecosystem service that is degraded. For example, farmers don't describe soil improvements by discussing macronutrient levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and, pot and potassium, but rather they focus on the, the presence of certain insects, such as dung beetles that we see in this photo, which are extremely important to facilitate, facilitate manure decomposition, avoid pests, and maintain soil health. Also, instead of calling soil, soil insects soil macrofauna, soil insects are referred to as soil engineers responsible for creating the structure of soils, except these engineers work for free and provide benefits on farm if they're provided the habitat via increased trees and pastures. Farmers are also encouraged to conduct experimental restoration techniques utilizing their farms like living laboratories. And conducting different experiments allows farmers to try different approaches, evaluate them, and most importantly, tailor fit restoration practices to their own objectives and farm context. We really want to get away from this idea of a cookbook or a recipe for, for every site. Uh, for example, farmers often want to intercrop traditional food crops within native tree species reforestation plots, which isn't really conducted in conventional restoration practices but it meets the farmer's food security objectives while commonly resulting in higher tree growth. Connecting students and researchers with farmers helps to foster participatory research, where they assist farmers to monitor and analyze the results of different practices and provide useful information to adapt management practices. Now as we move on to model farms, they're definitely a key tool to demonstrate a farmer's restoration strategies in an applied environment. The experience of establishing and managing one provides the rich experience and insight to overcome challenges and highlights the best practices that visiting farmers can replicate on their own farms. Development of visuals, like the map seen in this photo, assist the farmer to frame the introduction, facilitate the tour of the farm, or highlight results from different experiments. Selecting and developing demonstration areas helps the farmer to focus on the most enriching areas of the farm to generate discussion or facilitate participant observation and exercises. And having farmer sh shadow trainers is an effective way to teach facilitator skills because it provides the farmer with the opportunity to see their role as a future trainer by observing the methods of a trainer. The experience provides them with teaching methods that they can adapt and utilize when receiving visitors. The method is to progressively give the farmer more training responsibility so that eventually they tra they're, they're transformed into a, a lead trainer during a visit to their model farm. And beyond utilizing model farms for transmitting knowledge, teachers teaching farmers how to, to, to develop educational materials such as PowerPoint presentations, pamphlets, case studies, and other information are excellent tools for dissemination. The prevalence of smartphones and social media has provided a cheap and effective way for farmers to share information to wide audiences beyond their community. Farmers are encouraged to utilize technology and basic, tra and basic training is conducted on how to use a smartphone to capture images and video for posting on social media accounts. Free chat services such as WhatsApp uh, also help to disseminate information and coordinate activities within a farmer's association and so are so prevalent that they're already being commonly used. So now that I've discussed in detail the three components of our training of trainers model, I want, I want to return to the statement I made at the beginning of this presentation, talking about for, for more resilient landscapes and connectivity, we need to support farmers. So what is possible if we support farmers to become community environmental leaders and effective trainers of restoration practices? Can farmers share their knowledge and experience with others and inspire change in connectivity across the landscape? Let's take, a, let's take a look at a case study. So this is the Association of Livestock and Agro-Civil Pastoral Producers of Pedicy, known as APASPE, 
and, and they're a group of small farmers from, from the Southern Azuero dedicated to conducting sustainable ranching activities. And for five years, Apospe participated in LT's TOT model to strengthen their restoration capacity, develop a community-based association, obtain project funding, implement model civil pastoral farms, and finally become trainers of these practices. So in 2015, they began serving as co-facilitators of LT courses and have shared their model for farms and knowledge with thousands of people. So now let's take a closer look at the types of decision makers that they've trained over the past five years. So I'll start with the local level to describe their initial efforts as trainers with other farmers and children. And so they began sharing their experiences with neighbors and local farmers originally who were interested in learning about the systems that they had established through the project. And then Apostle members facilitated multiple ecological fairs for local children with the goal of illustrating how civil pastoral systems are a more appealing cattle ranching system through its sustainability and an increased productivity, conservation of, of nature, and also as a way to illustrate new hope and opportunity for traditional livelihoods while he healing and caring for a farm that many of these children and youth will inherit in the next couple decades. Next, we move on to the regional level where Apospe members move beyond their community and into other regions of the province. Uh, so first with uh, provincial farm associations, and then I'll talk, with, uh, I'll talk more about with uh, how they train producers from multi-province watersheds. So within the region, other farmers were interested to see the results of the Apospe project, which was the largest ranching project in the Asuero at the time. Field visits were facilitated for four provincial uh, farmer associations with the help of LT and regional partners. And one of the groups, the Ecological Producers Association, known as Savim from, from the Calabaso region, is an example of an early multiplier effect. Savim was so inspired by Apospe's efforts that they requested assistance from Apospe members to develop, and, uh, develop a grant application for their own sustainable ranching project. And Apospe having the experience helped Savim, which was awarded a project by the GAF Small Grants Program in 2016. And after establishing three model farms and participating in LT's uh, training of trader model, they are also training extension agents and farmers. You're starting to see that multiplier effect. And in fact, also with Apospe, Savim is currently training a new group of cattle ranchers located in the most important yet most severely degraded watershed at the Asuero, the La Villa River watershed. The project, which is funded by the Conservation Food and Health Foundation, is helping to train 30 extension agents and farmers, establishing 15 model civil pastoral farms, the first in the watershed, and the farmers will serve as the train as, as trainers to scale up civil pastoral efforts throughout the watershed. Okay, now let's move beyond the Asuero and into the national level. So I'll describe three examples here of, the, of a POSPE training, different land use decision makers. First with ranchers from the Sustainable Ranching Project located in the Santa Maria watershed. Second with indigenous producers from the Darien province. And then finally with officials from Panama's Ministry of the Environment who are responsible for implementing Panama's bond challenge forest restoration commitments. So moving north of the Azuero, as you can see from the map, one of the Apospe, one of Apospe's greatest achievements was helping to train 120 producers from the Santa Maria River watershed. These 120 producers are participating in the largest sustainable ranching project ever executed in Panama, which is currently going, which is currently going on. Um, the producers visited Apospe model farms and learned about the challenges and best practices of implementing civil pastoral systems. The on-farm training and, con and, and, and conversations with the POSPE members inspired the producers with the confidence by showing them that sustainable ranching alternatives are possible. And so these part the participants of this project are currently establishing over 600 hectares of civil pastoral systems on 120 different model farms. So next, uh, let's jump to the Darien province, which is located in the eastern part of Panama along the border with Colombia. The Peregrine Fund, who works with indigenous people from the Darien to conserve harpy eagle habitat, wanted to train producers on more sustainable agri agricultural production and restoration practices, specifically agroforestry. 
So 50 producers and extension agents were trained on agroforestry strategies by APOSPE members at their model farms in Nisuero. This was an important exchange because the Darien suffers from land conflicts issued, or land conflict issues between cattle ranchers and indigenous people. A pos by demonstrating sustainable ranching gives hope that people in the Darien can live in the same landscape, but in a more harmonious manner. Now through a, a, a GEF small grant program pro project, these indigenous leaders have established native species nurseries and agroforestry systems. Now, finally, on a national scale, APOSPE trained important dis decision makers at the ministry level. APOSPE co-facilitated a week-long course on, the far on their own model farms for 15 different regional officials from Panama's Ministry of the Environment, who were responsible for implementing Panama's 1 million hectare alliance, Panama's uh, bond challenge restoration uh, commitment, where they're planning on reforesting 1 million hectares throughout, the, throughout Panama. Um, over 20 years. And Apaspe's model civil pastoral uh, farms demonstrated the range of species and restoration activities that can be successfully applied by local landowners to enhance their livelihoods instead of cattle ranching con conflicting with the ministry's restoration activities and, and sort of always being a problem that can be a solution. So since 2015, APOSPE members have co-facilitated over 30 training courses, received over 3,000 visitors on their farms, 400 of which were regional and national decision makers. And this, farm re and, and this, this map really illustrates the scale that one empowered community association can have in disseminating, training, and inspiring others on restoration practices. This highlights the importance of developing centers of local knowledge who can catalyze a restoration multiplier effect that will continue as farmers continue to raise livestock and look for more sustainable alternatives. So as a result, connectivity across the landscape will have a greater potential increase as more decision makers have the knowledge, the skills, and most important, the inspiration to embark on forest restoration activities. So now just to finish up with a few conclusions, uh, a training of trainers model that is integrated with capacity and leadership training at the local level can help to develop community level environmental leaders. Such empowered individuals can lead efforts to scale up landscape restoration initiatives, such as civil pastoral systems, by effectively communicating best practices to other land use decision makers. Furthermore, increasing the restoration knowledge and skills of people across the landscape uh, this can help to decentralize top-down restoration initiatives and give more responsibility and ownership to local people. So with that, thank you again and bring on the questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jacob, for your presentation. Uh, and as a reminder to everyone, you can type questions in the Q&A section of your screen. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions that have come in, so I want to give as much time as possible the next 20 minutes or so to those questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so there are a few questions asked by different people around the idea of selection of the farmers that will be successful trainers. How do you identify those that will be successful trainers, and how do you recruit those to participate in model farms? Yeah, so this is a really good question, and... Um... You know, considering we're a small organization and, you know, we don't have people throughout all of Panama, we depend a lot on our local partners. So other NGOs that work in Panama, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Environment, uh, Peace Corps volunteers, individual, uh, different institutions who are located um, in the different areas where we want to select farmers from, we have, we rely on those contacts and partners uh, to really do a filter to filter out and decide who are the best uh, farmers to attend these courses. So, so who are the most innovative, the most open-minded, who are already, you know, um, with the same mentality that, that, that restoration is something that they want to work with. Um, and so we rely on these partners to, uh, to select uh, the farmers to attend these courses. And, and again, that's, that's, that's why I mentioned in, in, the, in, the, in the presentation that for these courses, we often invite extension agents, Peace Corps volunteers, staff from NGOs, and they have to come accompanied 
with a local farmer from the region where they're working. And that way, both of these individuals are learning all the material. And then we're going to have uh, that long-term support from our partners to provide that, you know, um, additional leadership and, and, and training, um, you know, to really empower the individuals who are attending our courses. Thank you, Jake. And following up on that, there's a question about how do you ensure inclusiveness and motive? It's a long question. So how do you ensure inclusiveness, motivate young people to participate and apply these promising models and include women actively uh, and in an equal way, taking into account their roles? Yeah, so that's, that's a really another great question and a difficult one for Latin America, um, where gender roles are very strict, especially in rural areas. Um, so it, 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 is, it is often very, very difficult um, to get more, more female farmers to attend these courses. Um, you know, oftentimes because, you know, their role is, uh, you know, pretty strict, you know, within doing things within the home and aren't allowed to leave for multiple days. Um, so we use a number of different strategies. Um, we communicate directly with our contacts in the field to, to try to look for, uh, you know, more diverse, diverse uh, farmer audiences. Um, but also we realize that if we're not connecting um, with our audiences through these types of multi-day field courses, uh, you know, in another region of the country, we'll go to them. Um, and we offer different types of uh, field-based workshops um, that, are, um, that are focused on uh, sort of the more marginal groups that aren't coming to our traditional courses. Um, and so that's, that's one of the ways we are able to to, to reach those underrepresented um, audiences. Thank you, Jacob. And that relates to one of the other questions. Uh, so a different participant had asked, does, uh, does, do the participants have to be from the same area or what if there's not a model farm nearby? And so as mm -hmm. you heard Jacob mention that they, just because they're from a different area doesn't mean that there isn't a value in helping facilitate that exchange at further distances. Right. Um, uh, also along the lines of this theme about the participants and, and their selection, there was a question that came about, about um, how, how can we empower farmers that cannot write or read, but are willing to learn? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, and again, this is why we, during our, during our training courses, they're focused 80%, 85% in the field. Um, you know, we're not giving long lectures um, and having people read case studies or anything like that. Um, and, and just because farmers, um, you know, are illiterate does not mean they cannot be um, empowered and they cannot be um, wonderful trainers. Um, you know, some of the, you know, most intelligent farmers, um, you know, are those who, who can't read and write because they've never had that opportunity, um, but can explain things um, in, a, in a field setting or in a model farm setting. They can describe everything, all the innovations and, and experiments they've made and the, you know, best practices. Um, you know, and, and again, I think depending on who your audience is, I think if we're talking about farmer to farmer approaches, um, you know, farmers are incredible communicators um, uh, you know, at, at that certain level. Um, obviously, you're not going to, it's, it's more difficult to have um, farmers that are illiterate, illiterate produce a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, with, or write a case study or something like that. But if it's more visual, of course, they can, they can still train others um, utilizing those, those visual tools um, is one way of doing that. Great. Uh, so we have a question that says, is it possible to incorporate this uh, content uh, in specific subjects like botany in the early junior or senior years of the students uh, in the community for them to be aware as early as possible? Yes, yes, it can be and it and a lot of this has been. Um, again, I mentioned, uh, so, so essentially LT doesn't focus uh, on, on facilitating courses directly to students, but um, in our case study, for example, um, the Apostle Association, as well as the Sabim Association, um, they regularly work with students, um, 
not only through their children who often work on the, on the farms, but they do activities um, that are purposely done for uh, uh, local uh, school children. Um, but it's a, that, is a, that is a really good point of integrating it into the actual curriculum um, of, of schools. Um, and we don't do anything like that. It's, it's more for them, it's more um, a responsibility of the, the local association, um, how they really wanna communicate uh, that information to you know, future land use decision makers. And probably even more effective for the local school children to hear about those subjects from the members of their community. Yes, that's, that's true. And, and, and again, like, um, I think that's why it's so important that they're integrated or involved in on farm activities, um, you know, and not just, a, you know, a, a new curriculum, uh, you know, in their school where they read about these things, um, but actually going out and, and being part of being part of the process. And really, and, and really, I, I, I want to um, emphasize the importance of um, you know, illustrating hope in these landscapes, because I think a lot of the younger generations uh, see, you know, the degradation that's occurring in these landscapes and how hard their parents and grandparents, um, you know, are fighting to, to keep these farms going, uh, utilizing these conventional practices. And I think they see that, you know, I don't want that life. Um, and, they, and they choose to, you know, move off the farm, like, which is, you know, migration into more urban areas is going on, on all over the world. So really, you know, you know, connecting with the youth at an early age, getting them involved in the farm and showing them that there's a different way of doing this, you know, um, a more productive, uh, ec uh, you know, a more, um, you know, economical way of doing this, um, but also a, a way of doing it that's going to conserve and protect nature and provide them uh, a really nice way of life if they want to stay in these rural landscapes. Thank you, Jacob. Um, so we have a, some thought-provoking questions uh, worded in different forms. I'm going to synthesize from a few different people asking this. Um, but have you had cases in which local knowledge practices or practices going on are in contradiction to accepted FLR methods? And how do you address this concern? So, so traditional practices, they're in conflict? Um, basically, farmers who are um, are using either unsustainable practices or where, you know, benefiting from local knowledge might be in contradiction with FLR strategies? Um, I mean, overall, uh, you know, you're going to, like, first of all, if you're, you're going to want to train, and, and this goes the same for farmer to farmer training. You're going to want to train the farmers who are interested in this. I mean, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot more time and resources to train the farmers who, you know, aren't interested in it, don't have an open mind, you know, and I, and especially from our perspective, like we want to focus initially on the people that are interested. Um, but that, but that's why, that's why I think like the power of farmer to farmer training comes in in that, you know, farmers, can, can, can help uh, change the mentality of their peers a lot of times versus an outsider. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's one of these really effective ways where you know, NGOs you know, cannot reach everyone considering their limited amount of time and resources. Um, but in terms of traditional uh, practices conflicting with FLR, um, you know, I think it's always going to be part of part of the problem. Um, but at the same time, I think FLR also needs to be or, or can be uh, adapted um, to to meet, you know, the farmers objectives and the context on their farm so that they can, you know, adapt more sustainable practices. Um, because I mean, you, you can't you can't go into a community and expect everyone to start doing natural regeneration or assisted natural regeneration how how it's defined by FLR. Maybe uh, you have to use different methods. Um, and and I think a, a, like one example I have of this um, is that a lot of the intensive civil pastoral systems used in Latin America. Um, are, you know, they're, they're really focused on two introduced species to Panama, Tithonia diversifolia and Leucaena lacrocephala. Um, 
which in the science have shown that they're, they're amazing for these civil pastoral systems. But farmers, a lot of times, aren't very receptive to them and prefer to use, to, to just manage uh, natural regeneration on their farms um, as a way to, to, to replicate the, tame, this, the same type of system. Um, and it just to shows you like, that even though these systems have been shown to function very well in, in, in published science, you know, they might not work with farmers uh, or small farmers in different areas and that you have to have that flexibility uh, where farmers can utilize, you know, what they know how to use and the different species that they have on their farms to sort of replicate something similar, um, but, but in a way and, and with the species that they know how to use. Thank you. There were a few more questions about um, gender and, uh, and inclusivity. Uh, Jacob already mentioned some of that, but um, our colleague Saskia Santa Maria uh, just posted to the chat a recent article about um, one of the uh, trainers uh, that's been trained and now is serving as a lead trainer uh, throughout the region uh, in her cattle ranch. Yeah, this, and this is a really good point. Um, so when we, when we focus on, I mean, some, sometimes you're just gonna get a lot of older, especially in Latin America, older male cattle ranchers, you know, that's what you're gonna get. But if you can seek out and find, for example, um, within the Apostle Association, yes, a lot of the farmers are older males, you know, in their 50s and 60s. But there are some younger males and there are some younger females. And it's, and it's really, really important to focus on them as well because when we facilitate courses on these model farms, we want to have a diversity of different trainers for, for our participants to learn from. Um, because there's always going to be that barrier that if, you know, uh, if, if you're from a marginalized group and you are being trained by someone who has, you know, the utmost privilege and opportunity, and it's not going to be the same as if you're trained by a peer. Um, you know, from of your same gender, of your same economic status, uh, you know, ethnicity. Um, you know, so that's that's really important that we that, that that we're able to facilitate our courses not only on a diversity of farms, but with a diversity of trainers. And and that's the same for for Opaspe. Um, while they have sort of you know they are more of a homogenous group of you know, older males, um, you know, it's important that they really try to develop. Um, the leadership skills of of the younger um, and and more and, and sort of less represented uh, groups to serve as trainers um, because it is just so much more inspirational um, from from those types of individuals. So we have time for one more um, before the close of our session, and I'm going to group it together for you, Jacob. Um, so people are asking if the farmers or the trainers receive a financial incentive uh, for either the practices or for being trainers. And they're also wondering if the community-based associations have a role other than facilitating funding. Yeah, I mean, um, okay, so, so yeah, a lot of good questions there. Um, first on the community associations, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, one of, one of the first, yeah, the, the first important points is that they, you know, it is a legal entity to apply for funding, which is incredibly important because otherwise it's really hard to get funding as an individual farmer um, or as a group that isn't legally recognized. But with that said, um, yes, community organizations are incredibly important for developing leadership skills, collaborative skills, um, and especially in the Asuero, they're incredibly important for making up for a labor shortage. Um, a lot of these restoration practices require a lot of intensive upfront uh, labor, um, and there isn't anyone to do this, um, to, to hire uh, externally. But if you have a group of well-trained, you know, 30 to 40 individuals who know how to implement restoration civil pastoral systems, they can work together um, to accomplish these goals. And, and it's interesting, actually, we've used some of these strategies um, to, to implement our restoration because uh, it is actually a traditional form of communal labor uh, that they've always used in these landscapes to either harvest rice or build adobe homes. Um, you know, all the neighbors go to one person's farm and they help them harvest that rice or build the, build the house in one day. 
Um, then they go to the, uh, the next farmer and the next farmer, and the next farmer. And so we've, we've really encouraged to really, to, to, to utilize um, these, you know, these, these traditions that they're losing, number one, to, to implement restoration with the help of, of all the other members, but also to keep these, these rich traditions alive. You know, they're, really, you know, they're really rich and beautiful traditions of seeing the community come together, or in this case, an association come together um, and work together on one person's farm and go to the next and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, they're inc you know, developing community organizations is incredibly important um, you know, for, for the collective action, collective effort, but also the collective voice. Many of the farmers in, in the Isuero complain, especially small farmers complain that they, you know, don't get support from local authorities. They don't get resources from the government. They feel left out. They feel abandoned, um, you know, which is, you know, which is, um, you know, very unfortunate. But by developing an association, they can develop that collective voice to lobby, to receive those benefits or, or receive attention you know, from the local authorities and government. So it's, yes, it is, it, associations are critically important for finding funding, but they're also important for uh, all the other reasons I just mentioned, yeah. Um, and there was another question, I think, tagged onto that. Um, if the farmers receive, uh, and trainers receive a financial incentive for being involved. So, depends. <laughs> so for example, uh, um, Apaspe and, and Savim, you know, they have received support um, from these different, well, from these different um, GAF small grant projects. So where they receive, you know, um, the, the resources to implement these model farm systems. So oftentimes it's, it's expected, written into the uh, proposal, that the goal isn't just to you know, implement restoration practices and, and establish model farms, but also that they have to develop a communication and dissemination strategy. So that because they've done this, they have to really share, you know, their knowledge and experience of doing that. Um, but then beyond the project, uh, you know, that's up, that's, up to, that's up to them if they, you know, request a, you know, a financial incentive um, they are really nice because, uh, you know, farmers do take time out of their day um, to facilitate these types of trainings. Um, you know, uh, in terms of LT, we do offer a little, a little type of incentive, but mostly it's through our um, continual, uh, you know, support of these associations in terms of, of technical assistance, um, you know, helping to build further leadership skills. And so it's often never, you know, um, you know, most groups never sort of ask for it. But um, it, is, it is an important question because there, come, there comes a time when um, you know, they have to sacrifice something else they're doing to facilitate uh, you know, a, a workshop or a course for another group. So, so yeah. Oops, do you see my screen here? Let's see. Okay, so unfortunately we've run out of time but I would like to thank you, Jacob, for a wonderful presentation and for everyone logging in around the world for your participation. As a reminder, this is the first of the eight part series. So we welcome you to log back in on July 23rd uh, for the next presentation. And uh, if you enjoyed this presentation and are connected to uh, potential people in Latin America who could benefit from a version of this presentation in Spanish. Uh, Jacob will be delivering this uh, very similar presentation in Spanish in September as part of a Spanish language uh, webinar series that we also have going on right now. And we'll put in the chat in a few minutes the, um, the link to this series, this whole series, if you'd be interested in attending or sharing with your uh, contacts and networks. Also, I, as we wrap up, I'd like to note that Jacob is an instructor in many LT learning opportunities at our training landscape in Panama, as well as our online courses and online certificate program. And in the next few weeks, we'll be announcing new online short courses in Spanish and English. If you would like uh, more information about those, we uh, welcome you to sign up for our mailing list at the link here, and we'll put them in the chat momentarily. Uh, as well as find out more about our overall program, uh, LT, at lt.yale.edu. 
and our online certificate program, a year-long learning experience related to these themes uh, at the website tropicalrestorationcertificate.yale.edu. And with any questions about this lecture, about the series, and about upcoming opportunities, you can reach out to us at tropicalcertificate.yale.edu, and we'd be happy to connect with you. Again, please join us uh, in July, on July 23rd, for the next webinar in the series, The Vital Role of Extension Services, presented by uh, Dr. Alicia Calle on July 23rd. And she will also be delivering a version of her talk in Spanish on July 9th. So you can check out our website for more information. And I'll put all of these links in the chat momentarily. And so uh, with that, thank you again for everyone for joining us today. We hope you all stay safe and healthy during this time. And we hope that this talk has served as some much needed inspiration. Looking forward to seeing you in July and uh, God bless. Thank you everyone, take care. Thanks for, thanks for attending.